Thank you. Uh, you for uh, those of you who have children, you can be dismissed now. I'm sure there's a, there's a right way to say that. That's not how I say it. They go in the back. <laughs> I should have watched YouTube and, you know, kind of got the, the, the litany right. So what a privilege. My name's Dan Smith, and uh, I'm one of our elders here. And what a privilege it is for me to come this morning and share with you um, about a topic that's very important to me, uh, about the joys of partnering for the gospel. Uh, when Billy and I discussed about me possibly preaching this week uh, during Missions Month, I was a little hesitant because I'd never been a missionary. And uh, like many of you here, I've never gone on a missions trip. Um, so you're saying, well, why are you up there, Dan? <laughs> but after further reflection, I realized that I have a great opportunity to share with you on a topic that I'm very passionate about, and that is partnership in the gospel, for the gospel, in the context of missions. First of all, when you hear the term partnership for the gospel in the context of missions, what comes to mind? Well, I can tell you for many years, I can tell you what came to my mind, which is um, I associated that concept primarily with missionaries asking me for money. And I've attended many sessions where missionaries came to discuss their ministries and the opportunities, just like we heard, the opportunities and the great work that God has called them to and what God's been accomplishing. And I'd listen to what they had to say and hear about the great things that God was doing, but at the end of the day, in my heart, I thought to myself, what they really wanted from me was to give them money. And I felt bad for them having to ask. I was like, I wouldn't want to be that person having to ask for money. And I also felt reluctant to give. And I'm sad to say that I even felt a little resentful because I'm giving to church anyway. I mean, you're asking me for more money. And um, so that was the, the hard attitude for many years that I had as it related to missions months and missions uh, partnership. But the reason why I'm so excited about being able to share with you this morning is because the Lord is transforming my heart and has transformed my heart, continues to do so. And I now look at the opportunity to partner for the gospel as a joyful opportunity. I've learned the joy that comes in partnering with missions for the gospel. And I'm also thankful that this church really views our missions not just as giving to missions, but as a partnership. We have partnerships with Delhi Bible Institute, with Thomas Charities and with many more. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what partnership looks like this morning. Um, but um, I'm very excited about the fact that Cornerstone has done that. And what many of you may not realize is, is that um, we as a session and the elders have committed to give at least 10% of our budget every year to missions. And that's a core value that we have um, because it's so important to us. And what I'm not doing this morning is I'm not standing up here saying that I figured all this out or somehow I'm the paragon of missions and ministry partnership. Um, I've got a long way to go on this journey. And uh, even through this process of preparing for today, the Lord has showed me areas of my own heart that I need to rethink and refocus to be a better partner for strategic gospel ministry. So this morning as we take time to think through this topic, I would ask each of you to just suspend any preconceptions you have about uh, gospel partnership and open your heart to see what the Lord might be showing you this morning. This morning we're going to spend some time looking at the Apostle Paul's perspective on this very important uh, topic in Philippians chapter 4. You see the title is The Joy of Gospel Partnership in Philippians 4. And also in addition to seeing what the Apostle Paul has to say in this passage, I took the opportunity to send a bunch of emails out to missionaries that we have at Cornerstone and also missionaries that are in my network to get their perspectives on what they thought good gospel partnership looked like um, and what, if they were standing here today, what they would want me to say and what they would want you to hear in terms of how they think about uh, gospel partnership. And so um, imagine if you would the Apostle Paul standing right here next to me and uh, many missionaries are standing here with me. And together we want to talk to you about uh, gospel partnership and what that might look like. So as we turn to our text this morning, and my, my beautiful daughter here is going to read, uh, read our passage, there are three, three key topics that I'd like to cover. The first is the basis for gospel partnership. What is the starting point for our partnership? And what is the foundation on which good gospel partnership is built? And then once we look at the basis of our partnership, I'd like to look at the beauty of gospel partnership. Uh, Paul lays out for us in this passage the structure, the mindset, and the operating model of how uh, partnership should operate. And it's a very beautiful thing, and it's very different than other types of partnerships that we have. And finally, I'd like to talk about the blessings of partnership. I'm very excited to share with you the wonderful blessings that can come into our lives 
when we open our hearts and our lives to partnering for the gospel. So we're covering the basis of gospel partnership, the beauty of gospel partnership, and the blessings of gospel partnership. And ask me and Lynn to come and read our passage. Okay. <laughs> This is Philippians 4, 10 through 20. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You're indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you, help, you send me help for my needs once and again. Now that I seek the gift, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Jesus Christ. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we approach this subject, we pray that you'll give us ears to hear and eyes to see the truth in your word. Lord, we pray that you'll convict us where we need to be convicted, encourage us where we need encouragement, and guide us into your truth this morning. I ask this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so in many respects, the book of Philippians is a thank you letter from Paul to the church of Philippi. We know that Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter, and the occasion of the letter was Epaphroditus had been sent by the Philippian church to Paul and was bringing him a gift, and it was a financial gift. Um, and he also almost died uh, when he did that. And um, we know also that Epaphroditus probably shared with him things that were going on in the Philippian church. And so Paul wrote this letter to thank the Philippians for their gift and also encourage them uh, to address some of the issues that they were having. And um, in chapter 1, Paul begins in Philippians 1, 3 to 7, he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. So from the very beginning, that was the first couple of verses of the chapter of the book of Philippians to the very end where our passage today, this theme of partnership and encouragement and joy because of that is a recurring theme in the book of Philippians. And Paul wraps up his comments in this last passage that we're going to be looking at today and shows how this joy, how this joy has come from their partnership with him. We know a few things about this partnership. Paul points out the fact that they alone were the first church to support him when he was traveling in Thessalonica. And in chapter 1, he says they've been partners with him from the very first day until now. And we also see in this passage that they've sent multiple gifts to Paul in their partnership um, here. So he begins this passage by talking about the joy he's received because they reached out to him through Epaphroditus. But lest there be any confusion, he wants them to know that he doesn't have any needs. Um, he doesn't want them to think that their gift has somehow placed him in a situation where he needs to be thanking them. Because he doesn't say thank you. He says, your gift has given me joy. And um, he's in a situation where he's under significant financial, physical, emotional, spiritual distress in a Roman prison. And he's writing to a church that also is experiencing suffering and loss and persecution and financial distress. And as a pastor... He knows how hard this is, and he knows going through these things can cause discontent. Additionally, he wants the Philippians to know that his joy over their partnership and the financial gift he's received from them was not because they met some unmet need in his life. Paul had learned the secret to contentment, and this secret forms the basis, the basis for this uh, model of gospel partnership. 
it was, as I was preparing this message, it was like, okay, well, we've really got two messages here. We got a message on contentment, and then we got a message on partnership, but they're very much closely related. I'm amazed how much I personally have struggled with contentment in my life. And those of you who know me know that this has been a big deal for me. <laughs> Whether it's my job or retirement or my physical and mental state, I've, I've struggled with contentment most of my life. It's been a big deal. And lately even, you know, as we've gone through COVID and gone through some trauma in my life, I realized how big of a deal it is for me. And also as I've talked to you, people here, my friends and uh, brothers and sisters here, we're a lot of us are struggling with contentment. And um, so I'd like to ask you this morning, are you struggling with discontentment? What is causing your discontentment this morning? Are you discontented because you don't have close relationships? For those of you who are working a job, are you discontented because you hate your job? Um, or because you feel you've gotten to a point in your career and thought you'd be farther along right now? Or because you don't think you're getting the respect and honor that you deserve after many years of hard work? Are you struggling as a student and your grades aren't what you think they should be? or you're not as popular as other people? Are you discontented because you're sick or you're getting older and you can't do what you want to do or what you used to be able to do? Are you discontented because your kids have left and your house is empty and you long for the sound of little children? <laughs> they're all here today, sorry, I'm a, I'm a messy guy. Um, they're all here today. So um, this isn't directed to you guys, um, but they're busy and they have their own lives. Are you discontent because you don't believe that you have enough money to pay your bills? or that um, you can't give your kids the opportunities that other parents can give them, or because you don't even have enough money to pay for basic health necessities? Are you discontented because you've asked for things and they haven't been given to you? You've prayed for years for something and it hasn't come, and you don't understand what, why God isn't giving you what you need. I know I'm, I know I'm talking to a lot of you here, because I know I'm touching on things that I've talked to people about that they are discontented with. And we know that whether we're rich or poor, whether we're blessed or whether we struggle, in all these situations, all of us struggle with contentment. In fact, the very sin that led to Satan's downfall was he was discontented about the glory that God was getting, and he wanted it for himself. And the Garden of Eden, what was the sin that Adam and Eve committed? They were discontented with God saying, don't eat this fruit. They wanted to know, be like God, to know good and evil. They weren't contented with what God, the boundaries that God had set for them. And in James chapter 4, we read that discontentment is the source of our conflict. James, in James, it says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you can't obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You don't have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. So if discontentment is a struggle for you this morning, there are three encouragements I want to give you from this passage. First of all, the Apostle Paul struggled with contentment. He said, I've learned to be content. That's a big encouragement to me, that the Apostle Paul struggled with this topic. And if he struggled with it and I struggle with it, I don't feel so bad because he's the Apostle Paul. So that was the first one. The second one is that he learned contentment. It's something that can be learned. And it's not something that just happens when we become Christians. We don't all of a sudden become content. We have to learn it. And we have to learn it as we face difficulties, as we face disappointments, as we face success. Whatever the idols are in our hearts that lead to our discontentment need to be put to death. And that takes time. So the encouragement this morning is if you're struggling with contentment, it's to know that we're all on this journey. We're all learning to be content. And it's, you're not alone. And finally, the last encouragement I think we can take from this is that if we are struggling with contentment and we're struggling to learn how to be content, that's a lot better than if we're not. Meaning, if we're not, if we're content because we're satisfying our heart with the things of this world and not the things of God, that is not where we need to be. So the fact that we're struggling with contentment and we're struggling to find our contentment in God, that's a good thing. So I want to encourage you with those three things if you're struggling with discontentment this morning. Be encouraged. You're not alone. And it shows that God is working your heart to bring about biblical contentment. So Paul says, I found the secret to contentment. What is it? He uses the term secret. He says, I know how to brought low and I know how to abound in every, in every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. We read in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is the secret to contentment. To learn that God has provided everything we need to face in our lives, whether we face good or bad, whether we face suffering or blessing, as we live in him and he gives us strength to face whatever he calls to face in this life, we can find contentment. 
Paul isn't saying here, I can do anything. I can't jump over a building. Um, I can't be wealthy if I don't have money. I'm not going to just rise above my circumstances. I may not be the most powerful or popular person in the room. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying, I can do all things that God brings into my life through Christ who gives me strength. Ligon Duncan has given a definition here, and he said, the secret to contentment for us is to approbate divine providence in our hearts. It's a mouthful, but I love the definition. I'd like to take it apart for a minute. First of all, divine providence. Divine providence is God's sovereign, sovereign, loving, providing hand at work in my life, in your life, as he works, and he's promised all things to work together for good. That's his hand at work in our lives. In Romans 8, 28, it says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. John Piper has said that Paul's secret is faith in God's sovereignty and the, the sweetness of Christ. You might say to me, well, I agree with that. Of course I believe in providence. God is providentially working in my life. But the other part of the definition is very important of what Lincoln Duggan said, which is the heart's approbation of it. And what he means is, that our hearts need to get a hold of God's providence as we face the circumstances of our life. In the disappointments of life and the frustrated desires that we have, our hearts need to know that God is for our good. He is for your good. He's for my good. And that nothing in my life is there without his sovereign hand, his loving hand, and that he is giving me the strength that I need to live in relationship with him if you are in a believer in faith. Paul is saying, saying that the secret to contentment is found as I live in my circumstances in Christ. Earlier in the book in 121, he says, for me to live is Christ. Paul possesses everything. In Christ, we are the most secure, blessed, satisfied people, and the world can't take that away. Our contentment is not dependent on our circumstances. It's not. It's dependent on our relationship with God, the rock that is Jesus, and our lives are secure in him. As we learn that, as our hearts approbate that, we can learn to be content regardless of our circumstances and regardless of our disappointments, regardless of our suffering, our wealth, or our blessing. That is a secret. Christ is our life. life. Our lives are wrapped up in him, and that's how we can learn to be content. Well, it seems simple, but it's not. Our hearts are so prone for control and so prone to doubt the good sovereign hand of God, and we become discontent. It's hard. Later in the passage in verse 19, Paul adds and says, My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Jesus Christ. So he meets my needs, he meets your needs. A few weeks ago, Billy preached on Hebrews 13, and he said, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with, you, with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. The key to contentment is the fact that God will never leave us or forsake us. So believing this promise that God will never leave us or forsake us no matter what we face breaks this power of discontentment and covetousness. I love this list. I read an art, a blog in the Gospel Coalition by Jason Hepelos. And in this article, he talks about the longings of our heart that can only be met in Christ. And I'd like to read through some of these, if you don't mind, uh, this morning. The retirement you long for, what is it but a desire for freedom and rest, which ultimately is found in Christ? Some of you can empathize with that. That promotion, at its root, is simply security and respect. Ultimately, these are found in Christ. Friendship, what a friend we have in Jesus, one who never abandons or forsakes us. Family, we have an older brother who leads the way and unites us to a father who loves us with steadfast love. Justice, he is a judge who forever upholds righteousness. Are you needing comfort? We have a high priest who is ever interceding for us. Wisdom, we have a prophet who always proclaims, a counselor who is ever ready with comfort, a provider who ever supplies, and a savior who paid the price for our sins, a defender who will guard and keep us, and an advocate who stands defending us before the Father. If we desire love, it's found in his spread arms on the cross. If we want hope, it's found in his resurrection. If we seek peace, it's found in his blood shed for us. If we seek joy, it's given in his spirit. Do you want happiness? Happiness comes when we know what awaits us in heaven. Power will rule with Jesus forever. 
Are you hungry? He's the bread of life. Are you thirsty? He's living water. Are you naked? He covers you with his righteousness. Do you need health? He's the great physician. Do you need wisdom? He's the fount. Do you need knowledge? He holds in his hand. Do you need rest? He says, come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Oh, that our hearts will be satisfied with Jesus. Lord, help us to believe that you will meet all of our deepest needs. And forgive us, Lord, for turning to idols, for grumbling, for complaining and being death satisfied because we aren't turning our hearts to you. Let's go back to our topic today, a partnership for the gospel. So Paul wants the Philippians to know he doesn't have any needs that aren't being met in Christ. And the needs that he has um, are met in Christ. I don't have any needs that can't be met in Christ. You don't have any needs that can't be met in Christ. We're not saying that ministries and missionaries don't have needs, but what we are saying, it's not the need that drives the partnership. Our needs are met in Christ. So this is the basis for partnership, is that our needs are already being met in Christ. So now let's talk about the beauty of partnership. And um, first of all, there's there's a couple pieces to this. We're going to talk about the the, uh, structure of gospel partnership, the mindset of gospel partnership, and the operating model of Gospel partnership. Sorry about corporate speak. I don't know what other word to use for that. <laughs> so first of all, let's talk about the beautiful structure of gospel partnership. Um, if you will imagine a triangle where you have God at the top and you got me here and a missionary ministry partner over here, we're in a triangle where God is at the top and we're at the sides here. Picture that in your mind as I go through this. So um, We are one core in the triangle, and we've seen that God is meeting the needs of both of us in Christ. He's meeting our needs. Um, And whether it's a missionary or it's you and I are sitting here, all of our needs are being met in Christ. But God also uses us, he uses us to meet the needs of one another in that triangle. And he transforms our giving and our partnership from a purely horizontal relationship to a divine vertical and a horizontal relationship as we're partnering together for ministry and using us to minister to the needs of one another. Partnership for the gospel is not just me giving or praying for a missionary, but it involves God who initiates giving, empowers me to give, supplies the gifts, and meets the needs of both the missionary and the giving partner in this process. And so there's a great picture of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 5, where Paul describes how the Macedonian churches, which includes the church of Philippi, how they met his needs. And he says, I want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity for our part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. So they, this church was struggling financially in many ways, and yet they gave, not just gave, but they gave bountifully, and they begged Paul to continue to be able to help uh, in his ministry. And this is really, the last phrase is very important. It says, this not as we expected. Paul didn't expect this. But they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us. And that model is that they gave themselves to God and God used them to minister to Paul. And so that was the, that model of partnership. That was the structure that we have here as we think about gospel partnership. Now let's talk about the mindset of gospel partnership. And this is embodied in one word in this passage, concern. Paul said, I rejoice greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. Um, now what he's saying here is not you didn't have it and now you do. Because he says later, he says, you, I know that you were concerned for me, but you just didn't have the opportunity to express that concern. So this gift that he had was a, an expression of that concern. But what was the source of this great joy? It was the fact that he saw that the Philippians were concerned about him. Not that they gave him money, but that they were concerned about him. And this word for concern is used 10 times in the book of Philippians. He uses this word to speak of a way of thinking, an attitude, and a mindset. Um, in, in chapter 2, verse 2, Paul uses this word to point to a way of thinking in harmony with one another, being like-minded, one mind together for the gospel. And in 2.5, Paul uses the word again, having the same attitude of mind that Christ Jesus had as a humble servant. All the uses of this word, this concern, this word's concern in the book of Philippians, put, points to a mindset that builds relationships. It's about relationships. They expressed 
a relational concern for Paul. Paul's saying their like-mindedness was demonstrated in a tangible way for the, by them sending Epaphroditus and sending a financial gift to Paul. And that these actions demonstrated that they had alignment with Paul in their gospel-focused thinking and that they were demonstrating the self-sacrificial love of Christ to him. And that gave him joy. And, and he says in chapter 1, verse 27, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or absent or am absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind or concerned together, serving side by side for the, for the gospel. So the, the, the mindset is one of concern. It's like-mindedness. It's, it's partnering together together. And finally, the, the operational model of gospel partnership. Um, and there's a couple pieces to this. The first one is uh, there's a sharing and suffering. In verse 16, Paul says, it was kind of you to share in our trouble. He was suffering in prison. And the gift that they sent Paul and the sacrifice that we read about in 1 Corinthians in their poverty um, no, points out that there was some level of suffering involved in this gift. And it demonstrated their kindness. There's a challenge here to us as we think about self-sacrifice in terms of partnership. We know that we suffer for the gospel and those who desire to live in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Um, and we know that suffering is a blessing from God. Um, but we saw as early in the Corinthian passage, um, the challenge here for me, I'm sorry, the challenge here for me is I think about my partnership in terms of time, talent, and treasure. Am I willing to sacrifice my comfort, my finances, whatever it might be, that the Lord is encouraging me to sacrifice for the sake of gospel partnership? Am I willing to suffer for the gospel? And can I do that? Can I live out that suffering through gospel partnership? Um, I cling so tightly to the things of this world. I don't know about you, but I do. And I'm so reluctant to share in suffering. I'm so reluctant to suffer. I like my comfort. I don't want to suffer. And I, as I was thinking about this this morning, I was thinking about the words of Jim Elliott, who was a missionary that was murdered by Aka Indians in Ecuador, said, who said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he can never lose. So this is a pointed reminder that my sacrifice and my giving in partnership will result in eternal reward. So there's a joy that comes from self-sacrificing in the gospel. As Christ meets our needs in the face of suffering, it helps us learn to be content. So we put ourselves in a place where we're suffering, where we're sacrificing. Christ will meet us there and bring contentment. Secondly, there's another part of this operating model. There's a giving and receiving that happens. In verse 15, Paul reminds the Philippians that they partner with him in both giving and receiving. So he's presenting, again, this model of um, a partnership. It's not just a one-way partnership between me and between the Philippians and Paul, but there was another reciprocation that happened between Paul and the Philippians. As you'll see in a minute, when we look at some of the comments we got back from the missionaries, um, partnership is not just a one-way uh, process. Um, the, it's a very, by having mutuality and connectedness, there's a very powerful way that we can partner with missions for the gospel. Developing relationships with our missionaries provides this kind of giving and receiving and allows God to bless both the giver and the receiver in that process. And I've, I've had such a blessing, even this morning, as we hear the stories, as I've interacted with missionaries and I prayed for their struggles. It's a blessing to me, not just to them, to partner. And finally, I'd like to point out the last beauty of this operating model is that there's an ongoing relationship. Paul mentions the fact that this partnership was demonstrating their giving to him not just once, but multiple times. And then we saw in the beginning of Philippians, from the beginning, you've been my partner. Um, so we get a picture of a long-term relationship where there's reciprocity, communication, mutual sharing, and love. And this is a beautiful picture about how God meets the needs over time of both the giver and the receiver in gospel partnership. And... Um, so, let's take a couple minutes and look at some of the comments that we received from our missionaries when I posted the question to them about what does good gospel partnership look like? Here's the question here. Looking at people who are partnering with you right now, what does good gospel partnership look like to you? I'm going to read these. Uh, there's probably 10. Next. I do next. I want a relationship with our ministry partners. Relationship. And it's so nice when a ministry partner wants a relationship with me in return. We just talked about that. Mike. A good partner cares about me just as much as they care about the ministry that I'm doing. 
They care about the work we're doing, but they also care about my marriage and my family and how I'm doing. It's not just about the ministry. It's about the person and the relationship. Having partners in ministry means to me that I'm not alone on the front line. I have prayer warriors who are fighting with me on the front line. That's a tremendous comfort to me, especially when the ministry sometimes can feel very lonely. Having partners who pray for me and check in on me offers me a great sense of deep connectedness with other Christians. I especially appreciate it when people text or email letting me know that they are praying. I can't believe how many times I did not have energy or zeal to persevere and truly believe it's the prayers of the saints that have kept me going, especially when ministry has been tough and people have not been responsive. Good partnership looks like involvement and care, not only for the missionary family or single, but for the ministry and churches and people that they're reaching out to. The best partnerships seem to have caught that vision and care perhaps more deeply for us as missionaries because they also care about the work and the people's lives that we're involved in. Good partners are those who pray for our ministry, provide counsel and encouragement, and if they're able to provide financial support for our ministry or the ministries that we represent. There have been countless times when I've been discouraged or frustrated about the way ministry has been going or I find myself dealing with a particularly difficult situation in ministry and a ministry or partner will reach out with encouraging note or text. So it was very interesting to me. I sent, I got probably 10 responses back from missionaries. There was very little mention of money. It was this. It was about the relationship that they were looking for and the support that they were looking for. Now, I mean, obviously, money's part of it, but that wasn't, when I, they asked the question, what does good gospel partnership look like? It wasn't money. It was this. And I thought that was very, very interesting to me. So, Last, last major topic here is the blessing. We've, we've looked at the basis of gospel partnership, which is all our needs are being met in Christ and we can have contentment. We looked at the uh, beauty of gospel partnership and its structure, mindset, and operation. Now we're going to look at the, the blessing of gospel partnership. There's a tremendous blessing that each of us uh, can receive for, for our participation in gospel partnership. And there's three uh, ones that Paul highlights in this passage. First, gospel partnership produces fruit that's credited to our account. And in verse 17, Paul says, not that I seek the gift, meaning the gift from them, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. So there is a, it's not the gift for the, that he wants for them, but he wants to see fruit that comes in the lives of the Philippians as a result of their giving to him. What is this fruit? So in the very beginning of the book, in chapter 1, verse 8 to 11, Paul prays for the Philippians and he says, God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and pure and blameless in the day of, be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. As we look at the context of Philippians throughout the entire book, the idea of fruit points to the blessing that's continually added to faithful ministry in the, as a result of the development of the believer's character and conduct to become more like Christ. The fruit is God working in us to develop us as we partner in ministry. Our partnership yields fruit. We abound in love more and more for our partners and for the, 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 the world. And we become more like Jesus. This is the fruit of righteousness. Not only does our partnership bless those that we're partnered with, but it blesses us and helps us grow to be more like Jesus. As Paul says, it will be added to our account. We know that there is a reward that we face in heaven. We receive crowns for the work that we've done in faith, empowered by the gospel in, in this world, by the grace, God promises us. But that fruit is also a fruit today in partnership. It's in the partners and it's through the partnership and it results in a sacrificial offering to God, which is the next blessing that uh, Paul talks about. And I appreciate Dave praying about that this morning. Um, we need to see that our partnership for the gospel is an act of worship. It's not like other human endeavors where giving money to a cause that we care about. And I, I've, I've talked to folks who are like, you know, oh, giving, money, giving money, missions, ministry and missions are asking for money. It puts a bad taste in my mouth. It's not, it's not like other types of transactions in that, remember the structure that we talked about. God is providing for our needs and he's using us to provide for one another's needs. Um, and... Not only does he provide, but he also receives worship up. As we partner with each other, there's a worship that flows up to God. 
And Paul uses three adjectives to speak of this word. The first one is fragrant. And the idea is, is that there's like smoke. I mean, Billy talked about revelation, how the prayers of the saints go up like incense before God. It, this rises up to God as a fragrant offering. And it's, it's, it says it's acceptable. Paul says this type of sacrifice is the kind of sacrifice that God wants. And it's, it, it, it's legitimate. And it's appropriate. And that's the idea of acceptable. And finally, in case there's any doubt, Paul says it's pleasing to God. It rises Romans 12, 1, where Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. So this is our spiritual worship. So when you send that email, when you write that check, when you pray, when you ask them how they're doing, those are sacrifices. Those are acts of worship to God that he had, assigns real spiritual value to. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing to be able to do that. And finally, Paul wraps up with a promise. So we saw that he, it's, uh, it's uh, anyway, God's provision for us. Um, I'll tell you what, there is a counterintuitive thing, and many of you experience this, I'm sure, that happens when you begin to sacrificially give to the Lord in partnership with ministries. Your perspective begins to change on your time, talent, and treasure. You receive joy from giving and it helps you properly frame your perspective about God's provision for you and also about how you're being used by him to provide for others. And I, the idea of an open hand, that this is God's money and I have an open hand and I'm giving it. it, it changes my view of money. It brings contentment. As I give in faith generously and sacrificially, the very act of that giving is an acknowledgement that I believe that God's going to meet my needs. And then it adds to the freedom that I feel to give away money or to give away my time or to give away my prayers or to give away my heart in concern for those I'm partnering with. Um, I actually, it actually allows me to strengthen my faith as I can express my faith in a very tangible way. We already talked about how God will meet our needs and that that's the key to contentment. But Paul here makes a point at the end of this section to talk about the fact that God will meet all of our needs according to his riches and mercy. Sorry, his riches and glory. Both physical and spiritual needs are in view here. And there are three prepositional phrases that Paul uses here. The first one is according to his riches. When you think about the wealth of God and you think about that wealth being brought to bear our needs, on our needs, there's no greater provision. Inestimable wealth. Infinite wealth. Inestimable riches are brought to bear from our loving Father on our behalf and into our lives. Riches are poured out to us now, and also they will continue to be poured out for eternity. This isn't to say that we won't have needs, but that he will pour into our lives all that we need abundantly to meet the challenges that we face from his inexhaustible reserves of power and provision. So that's the riches that he has. And then it says in glory, and this refers to the transcendence and the final experience of the riches of God when we were transformed to be like Jesus. Paul describes this process even now in 2 Corinthians 3.18, and it says, And we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of God are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is a spirit. So he's meeting all our needs according to his riches in glory as we behold Jesus' face and we're being transformed. And finally, it says, in Christ Jesus. This enrichment will happen as we get to know Jesus and we're conformed to his image. So, as we wrap up, I'd like to share one final question that I asked the missionaries. And if we could go to that one. Yeah, the others, do I have to advance it? Or? If you could say one thing to people at Cornerstone. So imagine they're all standing here, including Apostle Paul right here. He's right here. Uh, to people at Cornerstone that are thinking about the issue of gospel partnership with missions, what would you tell them? So these are, these are the quotes from the folks I reached out to. Don't put missionaries on a pedestal or let them put themselves on a pedestal. They can't accomplish anything without your prayers and encouragement. Paul prayed for all of his congregations, often with tears, but he also desperately needed their prayers and encouragement and likewise was encouraged by their tears. Get to know the people you are thinking about supporting. Remember, they are broken people just like you. Love that one. Seek to partner strategically and deeply with the workers that your congregation has a relationship with. Get to know and care for a few instead of vaguely recognizing the faces of many. In this way, you will strengthen your church's mission efforts and will also strengthen your relationship your church has with this worker. And I love that. One of, there was some extra comments that came with this one about, you know, people are looking for who to, 
who to partner with in missions, one of the things you can rely on is the vetting process that your missions committee has gone through to evaluate them. And if they're one of the missionaries that we're sponsoring, there's been extensive and continual vetting of these missionaries that to ensure that they're um, aligned with what we believe that their mission should be in the gospel. Get to know the people you're thinking about supporting. Oh, we said that. Remember, they're broken people just like you. Oh, am I going the wrong way? Yeah, I am. Oh. Hang on a second here. As field workers, we benefit from having deeper, more significant partnerships with a few as opposed to shallow partnerships with many. Partnering with a missionary is a commitment to the work of God in this world. Though you may not travel to the field, your prayers, encouragement, and financial generosity provide the spiritual and material needs to those who are. Christ said he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. We are the hands, bricks, and mortar of his church. Partners join the body of work being done in the mission field and provide what is necessary for the missionary to do the task that God has given them. As people partner with missionaries, they are partnering with Christ in the work that he is doing in this world. So, um, let me get here to the end here, sorry. Um, so as we wrap up our time together, I'd like you to challenge you, as I did in the beginning, to rethink how you think about uh, partnership for the gospel. The basis of our partnership is our contentment and our mutual provision in Christ. The beauty of the gospel partnership is its structure, its mindset, together, concern together, and its operation. And the benefits of gospel partnership is it bears fruit in our lives as we worship God. He meets our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ. And I would challenge you this morning to expand your gospel partnership this morning. Take the opportunity to look at the missions tables in the, in the, uh, the tables in the hallway outside and prayerfully consider what God may be prompting you to do, what prompting, prompting you, what needs a change in your heart and actions as you consider expanding your partnership in the gospel. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, beautiful passage this morning, and we thank you for the heavenly perspective that you give us, Lord, and we thank you for the opportunity we have to partner for the gospel. Thank you for the missionaries that we have in our church, and thank you for the people of Cornerstone, and we just ask you, Lord, to do amazing things as we live out the gospel in, in true partnership, Lord. Lord, convict us where we need to be convicted and encourage us where we need to be encouraged this morning, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.